All right, well, thanks for, uh, for having me, and plus one to everything you said with Sam. I totally agree, uh, and uh, we didn't have the benefit of framing things that way uh, when we started Clio eight years ago, which is an amazingly long time ago. Like, internet time is like dog years. It's, uh, we're, 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 we're one of the old timers now, but when we started Clio, we kind of framed things saying we're building for the Facebook generation. We're building for the lawyers that have gone through law school, using Google Apps, using cloud-based tools, and there's no way they're buying a Windows-based computer and a CD-based software as the way they want to run their law practice when they get out of school. So totally agree with everything you said. Um, so in preparing for this talk, uh, which was supposed to be a lesson that I've learned over the course of building Clio, I reflected on some of the successes and failures we've had over the course of building Clio. And I will be the first to point out that I've fucked up a lot and made a lot of mistakes, and I think that's a necessary part of building any successful company. Uh, but I thought in, in framing this talk, what would I give as advice to Jack Newton from 2008 when we were starting Clio? Here's one of the few things you got right, and do it this way all over again as you start rebuilding Clio. And it's how we ran our beta program. I think it's one of the most um, maybe unconventional things we did while building Clio, but one of the things that really helped create the success that Clio is today. Uh, so first of all, um, Clio does legal project management software. I thought it'd be useful to just frame what exactly Clio does before I dive into the talk, just so you know what I'm talking about. Um, so this is, uh, this is a screenshot of Clio, and Clio, like I said, is basically project management software for lawyers. So if you're running a solo small firm law office, which is most of the law offices in the world, by the way, most lawyers are entrepreneurs practicing in very small practices, Clio is the one thing you need to run your entire practice. And we were kind of a hammer looking for a nail back in 2008, where me and my co-founder were very technical guys, computer science backgrounds, looking for an industry to disrupt. Some old, stagnant, old-fashioned industry that hadn't changed a lot in the last decade, or maybe even in the case of legal, 100 years. And we thought this was a huge opportunity. We launched the product and cut to uh, 2016. We have tens of thousands of customers uh, in over 52 countries. Uh, we have... Um, uh, customers all over the world. Obviously, our most important market is the United States with about 90% of our customers, uh, but it's exciting to see customers all over the world using Clio on a daily basis. Uh, we now have three offices, our headquarters here in Vancouver, Burnaby if you're being technical. Uh, recently opened a sales and marketing office in Toronto where we have about 40 people today. Uh, and uh, also launched a Dublin office with about 10 people today. That's our beachhead for European expansion. Uh, you can't read this super well, but hashtag Team Clio is uh, something you can check out on Twitter just to see how much uh, funner people have. And to, with Sam's talk, I think, you know, 100% around building a culture and transforming an industry. That's the mission that I get up for every morning and what our team gets up for every morning. So eight years ago when we launched Clio, we thought, you know, what's the most important thing to get right? And uh, also quoting Mark Andreessen, if you want to read some gold for startups, go back and read Mark Andreessen's stuff when he, he wrote a blog just called P. Marka and wrote just an unbelievable amount of important stuff on building a startup. But one of the concepts that he introduced in this blog was the idea of product market fit. If you're building a product for a new market, you're trying to figure out, does this product actually meet my market's needs? And the conventional wisdom around launching a beta program, which is the typical way that you test product market fit, is to expose the, pro the product to as many customers as possible, to invite hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people to your beta and hope that you get lots of feedback. And unless you're launching a product that has kind of a bootstrapping aspect to it, like maybe a social network uh, or a marketplace, I think this is the exact wrong thing to do. What you should be doing instead is trying to find a small handful, maybe even just one or two representative customers that you can really put your arms around and truly understand the needs of. I also think you should build walls around your beta. So unlike the concept that a lot of startups think about, which is an open beta that, again, you're just getting thousands or uh, tens of thousands of people to participate in, think about a highly curated beta where you are hand-selecting dozens of customers to actually participate in the beta, and then you're picking a subset of that early customer base, maybe just two or three or four customers to really work hard on being a good fit for. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what we did at Clio. If you look at the timestamps in this email, by the way, this back, way back in July of 2008, real customer exchange here, where we were 
talking to a customer that was interested in our beta, but we said, by the way, you can't just, you do not just access the Clio beta. You need to get admitted to it. There, we created some prestige around it. We said that you need to wa spend an hour on the phone or a web demo with me and my co-founder, uh, Ryan Govro, where we walk you through the product. Um, you get trained on the product in this walkthrough, but you also get exposed to, um, we get exposed to all of the ad hoc feedback that the customer will give you while they get into the beta. And this was super valuable. This was so valuable to us because A, it created a personal relationship with a beta customer. We are no longer some anonymous internet company that they assume is based out of an abandoned warehouse in Delaware, right? Like we're real people that care about their feedback. Useful, um, useful in a huge, huge way. The ad hoc feedback is also tremendously valuable in that this is feedback they might never take the time to write down, and it's quick. So when we launched Clio, we didn't originally, uh, we had a large feature set, but one of the things we were missing was billing. We didn't allow lawyers to bill from the product. Um, sorry, can somebody back up for me? I uh, accidentally advanced. The other button will back up. Okay. Um, so, perfect, okay. So. All of this ad hoc feedback is something they might not take the time to write an email for, but will provide you over the course of this interview. And this was, again, hugely valuable in that we got all of this um, feedback that Clio needs billing out of the gate. So right away, just with a few conversations as people were onboarding, we got the feedback that, no, you guys don't have product market fit. And the last important aspect of this kind of curated beta access program was that it showed the customer was at least willing to commit 30 to 60 minutes of their time to participate in your beta, which sets a really high bar. 90, 95% or more of the beta customers you're recruiting won't spend half an hour, an hour on the phone with you, which also means they won't spend half an hour, an hour giving you quality feedback about your beta. The biggest problem that you can end up with in all open access beta is a bunch of tire kickers that log in once, take a quick look at the app and never log in again. We, talk, we, we call them the drive-by beta customers. And though that's not what you need. When you're trying to establish product market fit, you need highly engaged, highly vested customers. And this was a great way to run the beta program that, um, that was one of the most important decisions we made in building Clio. The other thing we did uh, was focusing on finding our Catherine. So here's a few screenshots of uh, our first really engaged beta customer called Catherine. And we struck gold with Catherine in that she started using Clio to run her law practice and started actually depending on Clio on a day-to-day -day basis to run her law practice. And I know one of the biggest hurdles that startup founders have is kind of getting over that, that first cut product. Like you think you're done, you think you've, you've got something that's usable, it's still breaky, it's still half-baked, and you can never get past that point. You never have somebody who starts depending on it on a day-to-day -day basis. So with Catherine, we saw, oh my God, somebody's actually depending on Clio. This was shocking to us, but also a hugely motivating factor in that we decided, if nothing else, we will make Clio work just for Catherine. And this was, this was the kick in the ass me and Ryan really needed because we were kind of toiling away and tired from building the initial version of the product starting to get some good feedback from beta customers, but no one was actually depending on it on a day-to-day basis. And like I said, this was the holy shit moment where you said, somebody's actually depending on Clio, we will make Clio work for her. And we worked around the clock, through the night, every exception that we got in our inbox that, that was, Catherine was throwing from the app, we would chase down and say, by the way, adding a contact now works. It was basic stuff, but we made Clio work for Catherine. And I think the thing for all of us to keep in mind as we build startups like Clio is the powers of 10. For anyone that's seen this video, think about the Catherine as, and these early beta customers as the customers you Zoom way in on and you build the product specifically for them. And if you're in any non-trivially sized market, any meaningful market at all, if you make your product work for one customer, you'll find a way to make it work for 10 customers, you'll find a way to make it work for 100 customers, and you'll eventually end up in the kind of place Clio is where we're well on our way to 100,000 customers. And that is my lesson. Side uh, recommendation is read this book. This was one of the early books I read in building Clio called Four Steps to the Epiphany 
by a guy named Steve Blank. This, I think, is really the book that set the foundation for the lean startup revolution, but he talks about this process called customer development. Um, stop reading Hacker News and being envious of unicorns. Read this book, and it's probably the best thing you can do on how to build a product around this kind of customer-focused development methodology. And that's it. Happy to answer some questions. Thank you. There's one way in the back if uh, someone can throw a microphone. Or you can scream it, I'll repeat the question. So did you say your customers are enterprises? And what's the question? How can you test your product? So find one enterprise. Get really close to Sweet Talk, Bribe, whatever you need to do, but get one enterprise customer. And that's, that's what you do in the enterprise world. You get one logo and lever off of that to every other logo you can. So that, that's the playbook. The tough part is finding the one enterprise. But find the one enterprise. Be really careful that you're finding an enterprise that is you know, in some way representative of what you think is the larger market opportunity. But solve their needs, and you'll, you'll be able to, to scale that to the bigger market. Another question here? Right, so that's a good question. The, the question was, how did we, with no legal experience, neither my co-founder nor I, and in fact, we didn't hire our first lawyer as an employee until like employee number 100 or something. Like, you know, we, we built the company largely without any legal expertise on the team. And that, <clears throat> that really came through, I, I think what was almost ended up being a benefit, which was looking on an industry from the outside and seeing A, how kind of, fucked up and slow moving it can be and like you're seriously writing down your time on a piece of paper. Uh, we talked to customers that had their entire practice stored in a Microsoft Word document that was 60 megabytes. Uh, and, and, and we thought, you know what, we can, we can do better than this. And also, even though a lot of lawyers will talk to you and, and explain how very specific their needs are, when we kind of unpacked everything and looked at how do you run a law office, we realized it's really it's really a project management problem. They're managing a bunch of what they call matters, but they're just projects. They have tasks, calendar items, clients, um, related parties, billable time. And we just built kind of a, the most awesome project management system optimized for lawyers. And we're able to just look at things through that, that project management lens. So I think there's certainly some industries that you need to develop from the inside with a real depth of knowledge of the, the pain point you're trying to solve. I think there's other industries you can approach from the outside and say, how are we going to innovate and kind of introduce a new paradigm for this industry? And legal, in a lot of ways, is one of the last really big substantial in industries to be revolutionized by technology. And we saw, you know, Clio was a great opportunity to, uh, to do that. Uh, question here? Okay, go ahead. Right. Yeah, so the question was, how do we select those first handful of customers? And that is obviously one of the most crucial aspects of this, this selection process. Because I think the hardest problem you have to solve when you're getting those early customers, and it applies all the way from the enterprise question down to, you know, if you're catering to SMBs or even consumers, is, is this feature request I'm getting from this beta customer like a real thing, or are they just a bit crazy? Uh, is it idiosyncratic? Is it customized specifically to their needs? Are they trying to fool me into developing like a bespoke spa software solution just for their business? And so we, we in the interview process, the other thing I didn't mention is that the, the onboarding process was also a bit of an interview. Like, tell us about your law practice. Tell us about your background. Tell us about the other lawyers that you work with. Are, are you similar or dissimilar to them in terms of your needs? And we're looking for people that um, we thought based on the, the kind of demographic target that we were focusing on, which was law firms between one and 10 lawyers um, that, that fit that, that need and were in the practice areas that we thought were most common and identified themselves as being pretty similar to the other lawyers in their space. So we thought if we talk to this person, they probably represent a thousand lawyers, uh, lawyers behind them. And then we would also cross validate their feedback with each other. So again, w within this small subset of customers, one customer suggests a feature, we'd go validate with the other saying, hey, by the way, what do you think of this feature? Like, awesome idea, or that's kind of a crazy idea, I don't think so. So we're able to kind of see who, who is giving us the best advice on a consistent basis that way. Is the value proposition at all before and after? 
the value proposition for who? Oh, through the beta process? Yeah, so the question is, did, did the, the value prop for CLIA change over, over the course of the beta pr program? And, and not really. What we just identified most clearly was what the minimum viable product was. We thought it was a product that didn't have document management or billing, for example, and found out that most definitely it did need that functionality. I, th I think to, to the gentleman's previous question, probably the biggest risk in that is that you pick the wrong five people that you're developing the product around, right? Like you, you end up in some weird echo chamber and build something just for those five people. But I'd also argue that, you know, the odds of that happening, if you're being pretty selective and selecting, a, you know, just a, the, the point is it might, not, it might be 50 people or it might be five people or it might be just one person if you're developing like this enterprise app. But as long as, you, it doesn't need to be 10,000. You don't need to hear, yeah, that's the right feature suggestion from 10,000 people. You get it from a small handful and you're probably gonna be able to make the right decision. And again, if you're, you're targeting kind of a, any non-trivially sized market, odds are that those five people represent a much bigger market opportunity, even if it's a little bit of a niche play. Okay, so I think that's it for question. So there's one more that popped up, but go ahead. Bonus question. Does the customer still use the I'm sorry? Yes, does the original customer still use the product? <laughs> Catherine still uses the product, which is awesome. She's our longest term <laughs> customer. And in fact, at our annual customer conference uh, just last year, she, uh, she came and gave a great talk there. So um, it, was, uh, it was awesome. So thanks, everyone. At Jack Newton, if you have additional questions.